All right, so I think I'm going to go ahead and get started here right on time. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Kelly, and I uh, hope you're ready to geek out here with me uh, for the next 30 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, some do-it-yourself user research tools. Uh, I've been doing this for the past probably 10 years and wanted to talk a little bit about um, the need and sort of why I'm doing this and some of the uh, tools that make it easy and share a few examples um, with you. So this is your chance to escape. A um, little about me first, I'm um, founder of Blink and we do uh, research and design work for uh, digital products of all kinds and uh, I uh, there were two of us that started Blink, and I uh, have always worn lots of hats. And the hat that I like the most uh, lately is um, working on the tools and methods that we use day-to-day uh, -day to deliver client work at Blink. Uh, I am not a programmer. I am not an electrical engineer, but uh, I'm really good at reading directions. Uh, I can uh, build IKEA furniture. Uh, and that's uh, really the skill set that you need uh, to do anything I'm going to be talking about uh, here today. So my, uh, my goals for the talk are really threefold. Um, the first is to share with you uh, some of the things I've been working on. The, um, the second is hopefully to inspire folks in this room to uh, try some of this uh, on your own products or, or projects. And then... Um, I know I'm not the only one out there doing this sort of thing, and I'd love to connect with other folks to hear what you've been working on or uh, heard folks uh, doing uh, and start uh, a little seed of a community out there um, sharing some of this information. So my uh, first premise here is that our existing uh, tool set really sucks. So, you know, I think that's for good reason that the tools are really um, one-size-fits-all solutions. Um, tools like uh, Moray are great because they're actually designed to do uh, you know, usability research, but um, sometimes it seems like uh, they need to do a little usability research on their own, own tools. Um, there are other specialized tools out there like um, dscout and others, but um, you know, some of these and even some of the, um, the partners and, and vendors that are out in the uh, lobby there, uh, you're talking about sometimes thirty to $50,000 licensing arrangements for some of those tools that just isn't practical uh, in the, uh, the boundaries of trying to deliver uh, a client project in a couple of weeks. So a uh, couple of trends here I wanted to talk about. So. The first uh, is some of the things that's happened in the past few years in technology. So uh, the first is just a whole set of really modular but powerful um, services that are out there. So you know things like cloud services, um, platforms as a service, you've got people building on top of things like salesforce.com or other uh, platforms that are out there. Uh, you also have all sorts of companies, um, young and old, opening up their APIs to allow you to use their uh, services in, in your tools really easily. At the same time, you have new business models that instead of the thirty to $50,000 uh, enterprise license, um, there are uh, microtransactions. So you can pay for you know, doing 100 or 200 uh, requests of their service or you can uh, often sign up at a freemium level and use their service um, for everything you need uh, at that freemium level to support these sorts of, of products. So at the same time, this is all going on, um, kind of in my personal life, personal interests, um, you've got uh, the sort of maker movement uh, happening. So you've got things like 3D printing, um, uh, small batch manufacturing of circuit boards and other things like that happening. But really, you know, looking uh, beyond that, it's really this uh, mix of technology and craft where people are sort of crafting technology or doing craft with technology. 
So they might be, you know, driving a laser cutter or a lathe or something like that with a, a program they just wrote or with an algorithm that they just wrote. But the the sort of um, core uh, at the heart of the maker movement is just this spirit of invention and this uh, philosophy of uh, fail quickly. So uh, iterate, uh, you know, try it out, find out where it breaks, and try it again. So uh, for me, these things all came together in, you know, gee, our tools are bad. There are these great ways out there to build tools really inexpensively and easily and sort of coupling that with this idea of try it, see what works, uh, see where it breaks and improve. And today we're at a point where you can build some really sophisticated uh, research tools uh, in a short period of time, you know, sometimes hours, uh, sometimes, you know, a few days or a few weeks. And you can do this on very tight or, or no budget. So I want to uh, share a couple of examples. Um, the first one is a, um, a situation where we were doing a study on the first 30 days of use uh, of a new product. The product was in beta, and we released it to um, users who were throughout the United States and wanted to track that first 30 days of use. The uh, challenge is getting folks to complete diaries about their experiences, good and bad, during that first 30 days. You know, how do you do that in a way that's easy for people, that they're going to have it with them um, when they're using the product, that they'll remember to use it, and you get good data back? Because at the end of the day, it's, it's really all about that data. So the big idea here was to um, create a system where they would receive an SMS message on their smartphone with some sort of a URL call to action, and they could then take um, that, uh, you know, click on that link on their, their smartphone, go to some sort of a mobile for forum and do just the entry of that diary entry for that moment or that usage, have that all stored away and uh, in some way that was um, safe uh, for privacy reasons, you know, secure for your client, uh, but really easy for you to browse as a researcher. So um, did a little exploration in this area, and one of the solutions that we landed on um, was really pretty straightforward. So here's what you need. You need a basic web hosting account. You can get this for $10 a month if you don't already have it. Uh, you need to be able to install WordPress on your server. A lot of web hosts have one-click installs of that that will build your database, put your WordPress install up all on its, uh, its own at the matter of a few seconds. And uh, I'll go through the, the steps here in more detail. And then with a, a couple of simple plugins and an SMS service, you can really create uh, a service to do this. So starting with the uh, the WordPress install. So um, I'm sort of preaching to the choir here, but forgive me. A lot of people get confused between WordPress.com and WordPress, the software. So we're talking about not the, the service WordPress.com, but actually installing WordPress on your own web host out there, because uh, that gives you a lot more flexibility. So you, you install that, get it running. Um, it, used to require finding a mobile theme so that your smartphone users could have a, a, a smartphone uh, uh, viewable experience. But now you don't have to worry about that anymore because the new default theme on WordPress uh, is mobile ready. If you don't like that, you can go find another theme. You can style this however you'd like or just leave it vanilla. Next is uh, installing a form plugin. <laughs> Uh, the one that I like is called Gravity Forms. And what Gravity Forms allows you to do is uh, drag and drop items to a form and make a custom uh, form for your users to fill out. So think about that like a, a survey gizmo or a survey monkey is you know, creating the survey that you're going to ask your participants to fill out or the diary entry or whatever sort of data you're looking for. Um, What's great about uh, Gravity Forms is it's really easy to use. 
it tracks all the responses in the database, in the WordPress uh, MySQL database. And you can export all that data out as an Excel spreadsheet whenever you want it. So it's really easy for analysis. The other thing that's great about it, and what makes this, in my opinion, superior to using something like a survey tool, is that you can have hidden form fields on that form for things like the participant ID and you know the version of the software they're using uh, or other uh, variables that you might want to pass. So that if you were using a survey tool, uh, and we've done this in the past, uh, and you send people a link to your survey tool, uh, one of the fields you might have to have there is the name so that you know who's filling out that survey. The solution like this, you can pass that variable in the, the query string itself. So here's just a quick example. So, you know, here's your URL on the top line. And then, um, you know, just passing as a variable in your query string, you can have whatever your field is called, uh, such as participant ID, and then give that a value. So when you send this to somebody's mobile phone, you can pass all of that in the, the query string so that um, they don't have to complete it themselves. You're doing that work for them. So just down here is a quick example. You've got your site, your, your, your form URL, and then say they're participant one, and maybe this is entry number one. So you can queue these things up for them so you can really let them in a few seconds fill out just what you care about and none of those other details. So once you've done that um, and test that data, uh, it's time to send some SMS messages. There's a couple of services out there that are, um, you know, some are for developers and some are uh, more um, user friendly. This is one that I like uh, called um, Oh Don't Forget, and it allows you to queue up SMS messages. Um, and actually say what date and time you want those things set. So, you know, the, uh, instead of being there at 6 o'clock on a Friday night sending all your participants a reminder to complete their diary, you can actually queue those up at the beginning of your study and go in and, and look at that queue and modify it at any time. So the cost for this is $4.95 a month. So it's pretty affordable to use something like this and, uh, and queue those things up. So um, then from there, what's great is you really just sit back and watch your data come back. Because it's a live website, it's not like using a, a paper journal where you're wondering if people are filling it out or calling them and checking up to see if they're filling it out. You're seeing those responses come back in real time. And you can set up gravity forms to actually notify you when somebody completes a form. Um, and, and send you all the contents uh, of that diary as well. So for about $50 and about three hours of time, we've created this little digital diary system that folks can complete on their smartphone. Um, and it's, it's pretty straightforward, but the, the big thing here is compared to where we've done paper journals in the past, we've had on average about a 15% um, uh, completion rate of those journal entries. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you get there, you'll show up to do a, a final interview, and, you know, there's 10 entries done in a row all in the same pen. <laughs> and you think, oh, I wonder when these are actually done, you know. Um, you're getting this data in real time, and we've had uh, about 90% uh, compliance with um, those journaling uh, entries using this method. So it's been really effective at getting that uh, data throughout an extended period of time like that. A uh, couple of things to consider, you know, you've got to um, be respectful to your participants about how frequently you're sending those prompts out. Um, depending on the study and the overall time frame, um, that for us may be from once a day to three times a day, depending on um, what you're studying. And then um, taking this further, so, you know, the one of the ideas here is using WordPress as your database, right? You don't need to set up your own database or have a developer involved in this at all. If you do want to take it a little further, um, this is an example of a project uh, we worked on called the School of Life Project. And this is a, a, a iPad app that is deployed in schools and students will go and do kind of a digital diary experience and 
um, the guy you see on screen there will ask them questions and it's kind of a self-discovery process. So we were deploying this in school and really wanted to understand how it was actually being used. We know, uh, or we knew how we wanted it to be used, but how was it really being used? So we took this, um, this diary approach uh, one step further, and you'll have to forgive me a little bit of um, PHP code here, but that's all the code you need and a little sample we found um, with WordPress. Uh, and we had the application itself send just a uh, query request to our WordPress site and uh, passed along the variables of who the user was that was logged into that app. And what it did was create a comment on that user's um, post in WordPress. So we were tracking all the behaviors of when they logged in, what questions they answered, uh, how long they were there, what question they stopped with, did they complete the whole session. So we could go back in you know, after this period of time and really see what actual usage was like. Um, so um, you know, again, nothing I'd want to show any of my programmer friends, but really effective for these short duration research studies we were doing. Here's just a quick example of some of the, the logs. You can't see it, but these are just quick entries saying uh, what the activities were in the, the iPad um, situation. So that's, um, that's sort of one end of the, the spectrum, um, pretty easy and, and quick to do. One of the other uh, examples I wanted to share was a project we were doing for a, a company who was designing consumer electronics for uh, the living room environment. So they wanted to understand what were things like light levels and sound levels, um, what were uh, some of the environmental factors that they had to consider when designing for in-home usage. So the way this research had been done in the past was they hired user researchers to go in, interview the families, kind of get the big picture of you know what the household was like, and take these measurements, you know, take a sound meter, take a light meter, um, take some photos of the space. You know, obviously the downfall of that is you've captured all that data for whenever you've set that appointment, right? It might have nothing to do with when the family actually watches TV or, you know, um, does uh, whatever the activity is you're interested in. But still, it was more data is better than, or any data was better than no data. Uh, for them. But our, our idea here was to try to extend that by um, having a black box that could sit in the home and do data collection of these environmental variables um, after we left. So um, we sent researchers out into the field and actually left little sensors there in the living rooms. Um, it was uh, didn't have any camera, didn't have any audio recording or anything like that that would alert people about uh, privacy, but we were still a little nervous about how this was going to be received. But we didn't have any pushback from any of the users uh, on the, the system itself. So the steps here were to um, pick a, a microcontroller. So um, we actually used for this project a little Arduino board, um, and if folks haven't played with Arduinos, I uh, highly encourage you to, to give it a try. It's actually something that came out of a, a design school uh, for doing some really um, easy hardware programming work. Um, so we took an Arduino and we uh, identified some of the sensors that we needed. So here we've got a, a motion sensor, a light sensor, a microphone, and we actually used two temperature probes. Uh, and we took the temperature probes and we attached those to some of the consumer electronics that we were interested in. So we could actually see the heat fluctuations when those devices were being used. We um, wired these all, all together. This is my desk during the, the project here. Uh, lots of spaghetti and, and cables. Um, wired these things together and um, using just the sample programs that were out there, you know, uh, again, not programming it, but cut and pasting the code, uh, we were able to get all of these um, sensors to, to talk to one another and then merge the code together so that um, this was all being measured, uh, you know, once every three seconds and then stored uh, onto an SD card 
as a, a CSV file. So that was our little proof of concept. Um, it's a great, this is going to be so much more uh, data, richer data than what we had showing up, you know, once and, um, and collecting this. So the challenge now was, uh, oh my God, we're doing global study. We need to build 80 of these things. So uh, one of the biggest challenges was actually to find all the parts that were needed. Uh, we were using a data logging um, shield that, you know, was easy to buy 20 of them, but it was really hard to find 80 of them. So that was one of the things that um, set our, our schedule back a little bit. Uh, but we eventually found all the parts, um, soldered these up and tested them in, uh, in about three weeks, and were able to deploy these um, in uh, five different countries throughout the world and capture this data in people's um, living rooms. So uh, one of the interesting things here was we actually... Uh, coupled this with a diary, not the method I described before, but we had a paper diary. These things were sort of happening in, in parallel. Um, so we were having people record or self-report what activities they were doing in the, the living room at the time. So the result was um, these really interesting um, charts where we can go in here and see, okay, here's the temperature data, um, here are the light levels, Here's the sound level going on, and here's the motion that was happening um, in these rooms. And it really became a, a pretty powerful um, storytelling tool. I'm just going to see if I can get a web browser to behave. So we can go in here and um, decide what sort of range we want to look at and um, see, you know, well, here's a, a good example where in somebody's diary they've said, hey, I was playing Xbox right here. And we can see from the temperature data um, that, you know, yeah, the, the temperature fluctuation on the Xbox kind of uh, enforces that. And they actually played a little longer, or at least the Xbox was on a little longer uh, than they said here. And we can also see um, during that specific activity what the light levels and sound levels were uh, in that environment um, during that time. So this proved to be very valuable information for our client that, you know, rather than getting these snapshots, was able to say, oh, you know, when people were watching TV, here are the conditions that they have um, in these, uh, these rooms. So um, the data itself was recorded to a CSV file, so we could put that in Excel and do anything we wanted to with it. Um, you can see I didn't stop there with this. Um, um, this is the result of doing a quick wireframe in Balsamic, and then I posted that wireframe um, to Elance and found a freelance developer for $150, built this little front end for me. It's all in JavaScript um, that would parse those CSV files and output um, this visualization for me. So, you know, it's really... Um, using that sort of maker mentality. I think there's so many options in there, tools and, and specialists um, to do things like this. It's, uh, it's really sort of empowering for, for us looking at tools. So um, kind of the, the big picture there is the home visits we were doing. Uh, I sort of estimated for each visit, if we were going to go back at different times of the day, about a thousand dollars a visit, something like that, when you factor in travel and you know five countries, averaging that out. Um, the loggers for about three hundred dollars, which is all your parts and the time to assemble it and some shipping uh, back to our office, is about three hundred dollars for ten thousand of those recordings over a seven-day period. So it's really sort of apples to to oranges there, but uh, was a great. Um, great value for our project and, and great data for our client. So um, thinking about sort of taking this thing further, um, some of the things that, that I'd love to do is uh, combine these two projects. So you think about, okay, a data logger in somebody's house. Um, well, now the new batch of microcontrollers have Wi-Fi built in. You've got things like Raspberry Pi that has SD cards built in. Um, you can have these things connected to somebody's wireless network and actually talking in real time, uh, you know, what's going on in the homes. 
So imagine putting some, um, you know, we had people in the diaries for this study uh, just identify four tasks we were really interested in in terms of media consumption. So you could actually wire four buttons up to your microcontroller. So rather than having a paper diary at all, you could have buttons on there so that when they start to play a game on their game console, they just press that button and that's recorded right on the SD card. You could also take it even further um, to think about having the microcontrollers themselves recognize what was going on if they're Wi-Fi enabled so that when there's motion in the room, it could wake up and send an SMS message to that user's smartphone and say, hi, I noticed you just walked in the living room. What are you here to do today? And then really sort of get that complete picture uh, of their activity. So those are some of the, the fun things um, we're thinking about next. Um, some of the takeaways, um, just when I'm thinking about some of the learnings from this process, I try to always look for uh, almost solutions. So, you know, you're never going to find something that does exactly what you're looking for, but try to find those things that are pretty close. Um, I've had a lot of success looking outside of the UX domain. Uh, in particular, um, what the marketers call the house of worship market uh, or churches. Um, they have a, a very similar AV needs as we do in user research. And what's great about that is they're at a very uh, a scale where they have very tight budgets. So when we look to do video streaming and things like that, there's often um, equipment recommendations and solutions that uh, some uh, technical person at a church has put together that apply directly to the sorts of challenges we have in user research. Um, read the friendly manual. I know it's not fun, but um, you know, there's such a community out there that's doing great documentation that there's a lot of information out there if you can force yourself to take a deep breath and uh, read the manual. And then um, really break it down into small tasks and just take one little block at a time. So with the sensor project, you know, just try to read motion first and write that to the card and then add one sensor at a time until you get the, the complete system working. Uh, things that are sort of happening now, I mentioned the wireless trend. Um, Internet of Things obviously is a big, uh, big thing that's changing right now. And a lot of those things are going to have the, essentially the Google Analytic version for your thermostat or your dishwasher or whatever. And hopefully those will all be APIs that we can tap into as a source of user research data. Um, there are some great API libraries like Eden that uh, does all the work for you, that talks to Facebook, talks to Twitter, talks to all these things, so that you just have to deal with it, and it does all the work behind the scenes. And then I think the other thing that um, these two projects in particular really addressed was this thirst from, um, in our case, our clients, in some cases your internal teams, for more quantitative data or more big data from user research efforts. So that's it. Thank you. I've got some um, resources here for some of the uh, things I talked about, and I would love to take questions if anybody has them. So if you're taking this data, what are you doing? That's a great question. So in both cases, uh, we've done proof of concept work first. So in the case of the sensor project, um, I built one and I put it in my living room and collected data uh, for a, a few days. We didn't have a week to do it, but uh, did it for a few days and then went to the client with the data and said, you know, hey, in the past we've been doing these single visits. What would you think if, you know, we could do this for you? Um, in this case, they wanted to buy our hardware, <laughs> which made me a little nervous because there was no hardware yet. Um, I said, no, 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 you know, we don't sell our hardware, but, you know, we'll do this project for you. So I think the proof of concept is really um, important. So. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, it's it was funny because at that time it was not an international study yet. So then thinking about uh, 
power requirements and international shipping of these mysterious little black boxes all became things we had to figure out. So, uh, my, my tip there is that mailboxes, et cetera, globally is your best friend. So, okay. Other questions, Mark? Yeah, great question. So um, there is a USB port on those devices. So when we installed them, we plugged in the USB to make sure the data was being reported. And then we unplugged that and just hoped it stayed working for... You hope they didn't knock the... Exactly. Or yep. Like and yeah, I think there were one or two that uh, out of the 80 that, that uh, stopped reporting, but we still had plenty of data. So, yep. Anything else? Yeah, um, in this case, there were three questions. I can't remember exactly what they were. Yeah, we were looking at um, if there were any uh, problems that they were encountering, because this was a big piece of software. They were moving you know, up a whole version, and we wanted to make sure that there weren't pain points in functionality that they were missing or had changed or whatever. So we were asking specifically about any frustration points they were having. We were asking what they were using it for. And we were asking just overall impressions of the software. And we wanted to see that over the 30 days and see you know, how it, it changed if it did. So kind of once you're past the honeymoon period. So. Yeah. Well, in this case, and what what we've seen work well is um, following up. We were doing phone calls on day three, day seven, and day fourteen. And so, what was great was our researcher could go review those log files before that call and say, "Hey, I noticed on Thursday you were frustrated with X," and then sort of debrief on those issues. So, you know, it's. The problem with more questions is always, you know, are people going to answer them and um, are they going to just kind of abandon it at some point? So, yeah. Good luck with your study, though. Kate? So, um, were you able to use voice recognition in the normal form? Like, you know, when you could do it like an SMS, like, or did you yeah. think about just having them reply with an SMS where they could just talk? Right. Um, we looked at doing a reply with an SMS, but um, it was technically more challenging in the time frame that we had to do it that way. Um, if anybody's bought a phone recently at AT&T, they give you a little survey after the fact of, you know, hey, how was your experience on a scale of 1 to 10? You know, and you just text back a, a number, and you think that's it. You think you're off the hook, but then they're like, oh. And your sales associate, Judy, how was she? You know, And then it's like, if you keep talking, they're going to keep talking back to you. So... Um, but that would be interesting for a, a diary study like this, for sure. Right. It seems like you could get better um, data if people would just talk or just have to Yeah. Them. Yep, for sure. There's a service out there called Twilio. Um, it does a lot of phone integration, SMS and voice and, and text. And they have a great um, speech recognition system. So you could actually do a diary study using just voice where you call the participant and ask them questions. You know, you'd type in your questions, it would read them, and they could respond, and it would do voice to text and give you a file back with that response. I think that would be interesting to try too. But you know, that again might be a little more invasive right. for something like this. So. Yeah. 